Next point. Number three is start demanding more out of yourself than you currently do. See, everything you have right now in your life, it is a reflection of what you truly expect to have. And it's the demand that you put out to achieve that goal. One thing I learned from Tony Robbins, I give him the credit for this distinction, and that was this. That there's a big difference from being interested in a goal and actually being committed to one, right? So you must go from being interested, oh, that's nice, it's a preference, to actually being committed. What's the difference? When you're interested in something, you'll do it when it's convenient. When you are absolutely committed to it, you will do it whenever and whatever it takes, anytime. I mean, Michael Jordan was at the top of his game when he was filming Space Jam. You remember the movie Space Jam, right? He was at the top of the game. Here's someone with high standards. You want to know what he did? He had a basketball court built outside of Warner Brothers Studios so that he could keep his game going and his skills up while he was filming. That's someone with high standards. Someone, an achiever, when everybody else is taking a break, is still out there hustling. Start demanding more out of yourself. See, you wouldn't want to lift five pounds indefinitely because your muscle won't grow once it reaches a certain threshold. You want to start adding weight to it. You want to demand more from yourself. If there's areas of your performance or your life that you know you just need to change, and if you change, you'd produce greater results, Step up, raise your standards, start demanding more out of yourself. Is it gonna be easy? No. Everything I'm talking about here is not easy. It's easy to talk about, it's not necessarily easy to do. I remember when I was a young boy, I envied my older brother because he read all the time. I struggled with reading. And I remember my older brother would read every night before going to bed. I came from a family of eight kids, and I remember every night we, he would read, and I think by 11 years old, he had read all the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew books. And it was cool for me because I would lay on the lower bunk, and I would say, Steve, the lights would go off, and I'd say, Steve, what did you read? And he would begin to tell me a mystery. And I thought that was cool. So I, like him, wanted to be a reader too. I saw the pleasure that he got from it. I wanted to do it. I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, I want to read like Steve. She says, I'll do exactly what I did for Steve. No problem. I'll buy you your first book. And then once you read that, I'll buy you a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. So I got my first book. I was so excited to go to the store. I didn't want to be just like Steve, so I didn't want to go, I want to maintain a little bit of significance in the home, right? I didn't want to go buy Hardy Boys and copy him, or Nancy Drew and copy him. So I went and bought something kind of similar, the Bobsy Twins. <laughs> That's the original book right there. And you can see it's kind of dark around the edges because, and that's a whole other story we don't have time to get into, but my house burnt down when I was babysitting one night. Anyway, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> wasn't our family's fault? Yeah. No, a spark fell from the light socket. But, um, and, and it just so happened, this is how sobering this could be. My youngest brother was two years old, and he had just woken up from a nap in that room on that mattress that was under the light socket about 10 minutes earlier. Anyway, so I got my first book, and I remember I took that book, and I laid down that first night where Steve was up on his top bunk, and I was going to read. And I remember falling asleep. No, I remember trying to read through the first page, and I couldn't get through it. It was very difficult for me. I remember I would read one sentence, would forget the previous sentence. And I remember in school, in the fourth grade, I wanted to be in social studies with everybody else, but instead, during social studies hour, they would take me out, and they would take me and three other students up to the fourth floor, put us in a small classroom with extra small chairs, extra small tables, and they would have us read cartoon books, and we were going to learn comprehension, right? We were going to improve our comprehension. And I remember I would go up there, and I got discouraged, because all of a sudden, I was down there, up there, reading... And they would have us take comprehension tests. And I think every comprehension test that I took, I failed. And I got to the point, I said, it's not worth it. I thought to myself, well, maybe you're just, some people are born with it and other people aren't. And I obviously was not born with the ability to read. And I got discouraged. And I decided to close the books. I stopped trying. And I didn't read another book until I was a junior in high school. Fortunately, I had a friend that supported me. He helped me do some of my assignments. Right? And I was able to pass school all those years. But the day that turned my life around was this day. 
We had just moved back to Washington. We were my, I'm an army brat, so we had just moved back to Washington. My dad retired. And I remember I walked in his bedroom one day, and there was a tape on his dresser. It was a copied tape. And on one side, in his handwriting, the title said, The Day My Life Turned Around. And on the other side, it said, How to Live Financially Independent. Now, at 15 years old, both those titles intrigued me, especially for the fact that I didn't, we didn't come from a family with any financial means. And so I took that tape, and I put it in my pocket, and I walked upstairs. And I remember that first night, I put that tape in my Walkman. You remember the Walkmans, right? And I pushed play, and I laid there while my brother was going to sleep, and I was <coughs> listening to it, and I could not believe the principles that I was learning. It was an old tape of a man some of you may recognize, Jim Rohn. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Rohn changed my life. He's my first, what I call my first teacher. And in that tape, this is one thing he taught me. He says, if you want your life to change, then you must change. He says, you can't wait for the weather to change before you change. You can't wait for your boss to change before you change. You can't wait for your spouse to change before you change. He said, if you will change, then your whole world will change. And I said, hmm. But there was another point that he said. He said, all leaders are readers. I didn't like to hear that. <laughs> that seemed a little too hard for me. But I wanted to be somebody. I wanted to achieve something. And I remember that tape led me to my second tape, which was a tape by Zig Ziglar. Yeah. And he said, all leaders are readers. I thought, wow, I really don't like to hear this. But their message was so inspirational, it just I kept listening over and over. And that led me to another tape, which was by Les Brown, Live Your Dreams. And he said, all leaders are readers. I said, obviously, I better do something. If I want to be somebody, if I want to achieve something, I better do something about this. And I decided my junior year of high school, I was going to go buy my first book. I only had a couple bucks. I went to the bargain shelf first, and I found a book called The Adventure of Leadership by Hap Klopp. He started the North Face Company. And I read that book. It took me about six months to get through it, but it inspired me. It at least inspired me to buy a second book. And my second book was my senior year, Live Your Dreams, again, by Les Brown. And I read that book. It only took me a couple months. And I can tell you without batting an eyelash today that for the last at least 10 years that I read a minimum of four to five books a month. Okay? A weakness, right? An apparent weakness that I tried to turn into, not necessarily a strength. Most of you probably in it could read a lot faster than me, but I can burrow through it. And I've read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books because I realize as I work on myself and develop myself, then that's just that much more that I can offer to other people. Okay, but it didn't come easy. I had to raise my standards. I had to step up. See, when we get to the end of life, there's two pains. There's either the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Usually, discipline only lasts a moment, but regret can last a lifetime. You heard about the builder who had a great reputation for building great houses, but he got to the point of retirement. He just wanted to retire, and his boss came to him one more time and said, would you build one more house for me before you retire? And his heart was not really involved, but he accepted the job. And he started to get to work. And he didn't use all the proper materials, the best materials. He didn't use capable workers. He did just enough to get by. And then when the house was built, the owner came to him and reached in his pocket and handed him the keys. He said, this is a present from me to you for all the years you've worked for me. How do you think he felt in that moment? Right? Regret. If I had only pushed myself a little harder. Most people are doing just enough to get by. But you know what? Achievers go the extra mile. They're lifting more weight. They're stretching themselves. They're going beyond that which is comfortable. Keep that in mind. Raise your standards. Demand more out of yourself than you currently do. And amazing things will happen. We live in a universe where a little bit of effort gives you a huge return. You can take a little tiny seed. Tiny seed. Put it in the ground. Nourish it. And in a matter of months and years, that will become a huge tree. A <coughs> little bit of action. And you remember Og Mandino? One of the classics that he wrote about was this, the greatest secret in the world. You want to know what the secret was? I'll tell you what the secret was, in case you didn't read the book. 
The secret was this, and by the way, he tucked it on page like 84, so the casual reader couldn't find what the greatest secret was. And I'll tell you what it is today. All you have to be is that much better than the next person. One or two percent, that's it. That's it. It's the big difference between achievers and the average. Just one or two percent. Hey there, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. If you did, could you do me a favor? It would mean the world to me if you could write a simple review or give me a star rating. I would really, and I mean really, appreciate it. Thank you in advance. Now go out there and unleash your greatness within. Greatnesswithin.com